just we'll go ahead and just go basic. Just tell us a little about the evolving of ESPN and where the idea came from. And I know there is the idea of adversity being how the idea came about. Can you just talk about that? Sure, I got fired from my previous job. Right. I was a communications director for the Hartford Whalers and the World Hockey Association, and they missed the playoffs in 19, the end of 1977-78 season. They fired everybody in the front office, ticket manager, communications director, PR guy, just got rid of everybody. And I had been scheduled, that was on Memorial Day weekend, and I had been scheduled to do a show with the Whalers, the, about the Whalers, the following week. So I called the producer and said, this is probably not a good idea. You probably don't want to talk to me about the Whalers. They just fired me. Right. He said, come down and talk to me anyway. He said, I've got to talk about something. He said, I've already done hot air ballooning. I've done minor league baseball. I've got to have some, something for my program. Well, we never did do a program. But we started talking, and we thought, maybe we can do some basketball in Connecticut. And I found out that a friend, uh, John Toner, the athletic director at the University of Connecticut, was a member of the NCAA Council and was up next as the president of the NCAA. So we began to talk, and he was talking to some of his friends. And along with all of that, we were talking to cable operators in Connecticut because we wanted to bring Connecticut events to Connecticut viewers. There was no way to connect them together in one guy because in those days, TV sets only had 12 channels. There were no satellites, and unless you could have a line of sight vision from point A to point B, you couldn't do it. So we talked to the RCA people. We found out that the satellite was coming. It's been up in the sky, but they just hadn't marketed. Nobody had bought it. They just couldn't. And the reason they couldn't is because there were no Earth, earth stations to receive the signal. And um, even when we went on the air, there were only like 300 Earth stations in the entire United States. Today, there are gajillions, I think. But, but anyway, we... Um, we started talking about the satellite. We found out from RCA that the satellite was a pretty good thing. Guy came up and talked to us, and we found out we could buy five hours a night or we could buy two hours in the afternoon. But he got all done with all those things. He said, we used to have another rate card item. It was called, um, it's 24 hours a day for five years, $34,167 a month. Now, we're starting out, we have no money. I've just been fired, and so we're thinking, that's pretty good. 34,000, and my son, Rasmussen Reports, are you familiar with that company, the pollster? Yeah, that's my son. He was sitting in the meeting with me, and he said, that can't be right. You told us it's $1,250 for five hours at night. It's $1,143 a day for 24 hours. Okay, so that's, and he figured out, he said, that's what the tariff says, so that must be what it is. So the next day, we called him, and he said, well, take one of those things. He said, take one of what things? We didn't even know they were transponders. We didn't, we really didn't know much about any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So the next day, we called him and he said, one of what things? We said, a transponder, 24-hour transponder. And we said, yeah, well, that's what we want. He said, you will? You'll take one of them? So now we had a transponder. Now all we had to do was go get some programming, financing, advertising, and customers. The easy part was yet to come, I guess. Right. Um, so it's kind of 14 months is kind of the idea of how long it took from right. conception to to launch. Right right. Yeah, yep. What were those 14 months like? <laughs> well, the first nine months of it, oddly enough, in those nine months, the things I just mentioned, we, we had the, we, we talked about the facts that we had to unearth, F-A-C-T-S, because we had a lot of things. To do. We didn't know any facts about anything, not, this, not the satellite or any of those things. But we had to get financing, and we had to get advertising, and we had to get some content. We had the technology with the transponder, and then we had to get some customers, subscribers in the cable business. So we set about on all of those fronts all at the same time. Um, we had this transponder in place. We met with the chairman of the TV committee for the NCAA in September of 1978 and started that path rolling. Uh, we met with several potential financing uh, sources all of which turned us down until we hit the eighth one in December of that year. It was Getty Oil, and we introduced the idea. So we were underway with, uh, we had the technology, and we now were at Getty Oil and financing. And um, the NCAA programming, we thought, was coming along. And then in uh, January, we began to talk to major multiple system operators about getting subscribers. And we had a meeting with an agency in New York to talk about advertising, and it turned out the agency was the agency for Budweiser, which turned out by the end of January, within a two-week span, they committed to a $1,380,000 worth of advertising 
which was by far the biggest advertising contract uh, to date in cable television. We also signed our first multiple system operator, uh, United Cable signed. So now we had cable and we had advertising and we were in Kansas City on Valentine's Day finalizing the deal with the NCAA. We had had several meetings, but on that day they finally said, they had said almost yes up to that. That day on Valentine's Day they said yes. And while we were in the meeting we had a call from Getty Oil and they said yes. So by February we had all of the yeses in place and the NCAA contract was signed and that was the key. Without, they were all key. But without the programming, none of the other stuff worked. And uh, March 1st, contract was dated March 1st. We actually signed it on March 9th. So we basically went in nine months to March 1st from uh, the preceding June 1st, seven months plus January and February. And on March 1st, we signed the last of those five elements and we were ready to go. Then it was a frantic run for the roses to put the building up. Our building, are you going to? Are you with us tonight? Are you going to see it tonight? We've got some, some great then and now perspective photos and some funny, funny, I say funny. You guys won't think it's funny. You guys think it's interesting because, but I just chuckle when I look at, because I, I can see the whole perspective from right. what it was and what it is. It's just amazing. But on the 5th of July, they put the tree on top of the steelwork for our building, our only building. We didn't have multiple, one building. On the 10th of August, we were still installing uh, earth stations, and you could see in the background half a wall on the building up, and we were still telling the world we were going on the air September 7th, and we did. Don't have any idea how the contractor pulled it off. Don't want to know what he had to do to get there, but we were there. Awesome. So the idea, looking at it now, it almost seems like a no-brainer, a sports network. With of course it does, yeah. Um, do you think it would have happened had you not come up with the idea? Like eventually, do you think somebody... Sure. Yeah, well, think, think what you just said. Mm -hmm. It's like a no-brainer. Look at the lights in the room. What Edison had was a no-brainer. Right. Think about the telephones, not the way they are today, but Alexander Graham Bell did pretty well with that idea. Or how about Henry Ford? They were all no-brainers. Horse and carriage was great until Henry Ford came along and said, well, there were others along the way, a lot of them doing it. Mm -hmm. And when they become huge successes, everybody says... You know, I had that idea. So I do hear that a lot, but if it wasn't me, it would have been somebody else. I mean, we're just, we're such a creative nation, and we're a nation of sports fans. You know, think about what's the biggest single constituency you can think of, if you really think about it. It's not politicians. People don't, it doesn't make a difference which party you're thinking of. That's not an all-encompassing group in our country. Uh, young, old, male, female, northeast, southwest, rich, poor, doesn't make any difference. If you're a fan, you can be sitting next to a millionaire or sitting next to, you know, whatever. And uh, that's what ESPN does. They serve the fans. And if you have a market like that and you can provide the product, which is what ESPN is, you can charge a lot of money, sell a lot of advertising, and make a very successful business. Right. Is there, out of, you mentioned all the other innovators, and you've been honored quite a bit over since it's been ESPN's come about is there any like specific honor award that really stands out to you that you go wow I really I'm actually really proud of this one award or this one well award. obviously I'm proud of all of them that people would even think those kind things mm -hmm. and I'm constantly amazed because it seems like it was it was a job and it was one that I met with passion and wanted to wanted to do and uh, I, I don't think there's any one. I, I'm surprised every time I get most all of those start off with a FedEx arriving at the front door and they say, you know, open it up and says, you have been <laughs> and whatever, fill in the blank. And I go, wow, that's pretty good. Guess I'm going to go to New York or Miami or wherever I'm going to go. I, I'm just not. Uh, you don't I'm, get tired of them. It's just like. No, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm honored. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes surprised. Uh, well, I'm always surprised that someone would think that, but it's, um, I guess, to me it was, it was what I wanted to do, and it was a job, and it turned out to be a roaring success. And that's great. And people want to talk about that, that's great. Talking to you folks today, I'm honored that you're here and want to talk about this stuff. That's great. 
So that's kind of the way, I, uh, there's not any one in particular that's, uh, you know, I'm proud of what the network gets. Their first Emmy, I was proud of that. The first Cable Ace Award, the, you know, and now they've had so many hundreds, and probably thousands of awards over the years. And that's, that's pretty neat. And I am particularly proud that they got ABC's Monday Night Football is now on ESPN. Mm -hmm. yes. That was a thrill to hear that uh, Monday Night Football jingle on ESPN on the first game. I, <clears throat> I met with Pete Rozelle in 1979. He was the commissioner then. He listened very attentively and said, not today, but someday the NFL will be on ESPN. And it, before the 80s were over, we had half a season. By the 90s, we had Sunday night football, and then 2006, Monday night football. So those are the kinds of things of which I'm, I'm really proud and, and pleased that they all happen. Mm -hmm. And things like SportsCenter. Who ever heard of doing a silly program like a half-hour sports news? And then we said, we're going to put it on opposite ABC, NBC, and CBS Evening News in New York. And they said, you can't do that. Why not? Where's, the, where's it written that nobody can compete with them? They said, well, nobody will watch you. Because at that time when we said this, 93% of the viewing audience at that hour, 6.30, watched one of the three shows. They were living high. They had all kinds of advertising. But our theory was if one tells another, if you watch and you tell another and the two of you tell another and the two of you tell another, the end of the story is today over 100 million people watch SportsCenter every single month. Is now, you mentioned how now that Sunday Night Football has kind of come into, or it has come into ESPN. Monday Night Football, Monday Night Football now, yeah. Right. I know right now there's a big push with the Olympics, and NBC's contract is going to be up, I think, after this next one. Um, or I know ESPN is pushing for. Yeah, they just had a they had a bid. NBC won the most recent one for I don't know how many years. ESPN is obviously reaching for all of those um, rights, long term rights, and they've tied up a lot of contracts into the 2020s. Mm -hmm. um, but the but the um, Olympics and NBC have been together for a long time, and it's going to be a that's a tough one to crack at least at the moment. What do you think of? I know there's the it's kind of a. There's two sides to the idea that NBC does the whole where they, like if it, when it was in China, they, the big sports they would put on during prime time in America, so they'd film them, and even though we already knew the results, we wouldn't watch it until prime time in America. But I know ESPN now, a lot of the um, head honchos are saying the reason they want um, the Olympics and their idea for it is it would be on when it's happening. Yeah, live. Do you, do you, do you think I, it's better to show during prime time when people can sit down or if it's at 3 a.m.? The, the, the prime time idea, I think, generated from when the networks were founded back in the 40s. And a New York mentality said, well, we all go to bed after the 11 o'clock news or we all go to bed after the late show. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> on the West Coast, it's, <laughs> it's only 9 o'clock. Right. So... Um, that talk about prime time and delay and we're going to announce the score, turn your head if you don't want to know the results and all that stuff. I, I think eventually that's all going to go away. Everything, especially with ESPN doing what they're doing, it's going, everything will be live eventually. And if they don't do it, they'll force whoever has the rights to do it mm -hmm. because people want to know now. It's just amazing. We've become such an instant society. What about um, going back to the honors and awards? In 2009, you got to throw out the first pitch. One thing I want to do one day is to have a first pitch. What was that like? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that I played in organized leagues up until I was 50. So I played a lot of baseball over the years. One of the most, uh, you know, I wanted the same kinds of things. Well, you know, this, the Philadelphia Phillies have been sold out since the invention of baseball, according to them. Not quite, but, you know, it's going to be 45,000 of your closest friends are going to be in the stands watching. First of all, I wanted to throw a strike, no question. Oh, yeah. So when they told me I was going to do it, I hadn't thrown a ball in a number of years, and I went out and I started throwing a ball so that I could make sure I could throw it that far because I was not going to be embarrassed. And I was not going to stand in front and just kind of... So I practiced and I threw and I did that, so I, I knew I could throw it. I knew I could throw a pitch. I, that was not a problem. What surprised me was when the lady in charge, it's, uh, it was a televised game. I was part of ESPN's Monday night, uh, Sunday Night Baseball, and so everything's timed, and you have to be there. And she, we walked, and she said, let's go. We'll go out to the foul line, and um, wait a second, and I'll tell you when to go. And she said, you know, she'll tap me on, on the shoulder on the way out. She gave me the ball, and then she said, okay. And we're standing in the grass just out. So I'm like two strides. I'm over the foul line. 
the instant I stepped over the foul line, it was like I had never left. It was like I was playing baseball again. Saw the people, waved to the crowd as they introduced, and everybody does their thing. And then walked up the mound and threw a strike. And uh, it, I am, I had thought, you know, I've never done that in the base, and it's, you know, I was not exactly in playing shape. But it, for some reason, mentally it didn't, I wasn't a bit nervous. I don't know how that works, but uh, it was great. And it was, it was a hoot. It was fun to do. And Tony Danza sang the national anthem that night. And, and he came over, and when he found out it was the ESPN guy, we talked sports for a while. So that nice. was kind of fun. Nice. Um, all right, well, just kind of any closing advice for dreamers with big ideas who are going through troubles, or even just us with the show and trying to put stuff out there. Just Be excited about what you're doing. Be positive and enthusiastic. And whatever you do when you're selling it to somebody, don't say, what do you think about this? I, we've got an idea, but just go in and, and tell him it's the best idea he's going to hear ever in his life. Not just today, it's the very best idea. Because if you came to me and you weren't positive, or let's put it the other way, if I came to you and I wasn't positive, would you, you'd probably say, I don't know about that idea. But if I came to you and I said, we're going to do this sports thing 24 hours a day. This is going to be the greatest thing in the history of television. And I was really enthused. You might still say, he's nuts when I walk out the door. But you might say, wow, that's kind of enthusiasm. We better talk to him again. And I think that's what you have to do. You just absolutely have to be positive and believe in your idea. Because if you don't believe in it, why would anyone else? That's great. All right. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, really thank you. It. Really enjoyed it.